Discovering Alabama is a production of the Alabama Museum of Natural History. It's a thirsty world, parched, dry, and otherwise struggling for fresh water in many places. In many places, but not here. Not in this special place. Alabama, where mountain springs feed mountain streams that sculpt their way across the landscape seeking union with brooks and creeks and giving rise to the rivers. The rivers. Before mankind ever ventured into this land we now call Alabama, the rivers flowed. Full of life, swimming with the wonders of creation. I'm Doug Phillips. There's nothing like a pleasant ride on an Alabama River. It's a luxury we take for granted in our state. While much of the world thirsts for fresh water, our home is brimming over. Today, we're gonna to take a cruise on an Alabama River for an up-close look at the state's remarkable stream and freshwater resources. We'll see how the earliest peoples of our region depended on the rivers for their livelihoods, their transportation, and their borders. We'll see how we continue to use our rivers in much the same way today. And we'll see that this seemingly endless resource may in fact be finite. As we look to the future, will this life-giving water always be there for us? This program is about a land unknown to many people, a land that in many ways has maintained its native natural wonders, a place of bountiful backcountry, forests, streams, and wildlife more diverse than can be found in much of the inhabited world. Come along with me as we explore the wild wonders of this land. Come along as we discover Alabama. Welcome to Discovering Alabama, and welcome to the river. No matter where you are in Alabama, you're never far from the river. The broad shoulders of the Tennessee, the gentle flow of the Tallapoosa, the rush of the Coosa, the sparkle of the Cahaba, the might of the Black Warrior, the expanse of the Tom Bigby, the mystery of the Conecuh, the history of the Alabama. We could spend the day naming the rivers and streams of Alabama and still not name them all. But what's the big deal with singling out Alabama? After all, isn't this earth of ours the blue planet? When astronauts journeyed to the moon in the late 60s, this photograph of Earthrise dramatically illustrated just what a water world we live on. Yet, somewhat ironically, the vast majority of this H2O is seawater, unfit for human consumption. Even the bulk of the Earth's freshwater is beyond our reach, being contained in the polar caps. Planet-wide water, so abundant looking from space, is often as rare as gold, and perhaps more valuable to those who thirst. But you don't necessarily have to go to the desert to find a thirst for fresh water. Just east of Alabama, Atlanta, Georgia, is struggling to find new sources of potable water for its burgeoning population. So how did we in Alabama get to be so lucky? Well, we're blessed with climate, topography, and geology that invite plentiful water to literally fall from the heavens. Ages upon ages of rain have built up the region's vast water reserves. 
As these fresh waters seek their way back to the oceans, they fill the rivers of three major river basins. The Tennessee Valley is actually connected to the Mississippi River drainage system as the Tennessee River flows into the Ohio River, which flows into the Mississippi. In Alabama's southeast, a second major basin is made up of coastal rivers, the Perdido, Conecuh, Yella, Choctahatchee, Chipola, and the Chattahoochee. These rivers flow through sparsely populated landscapes and still hold a sense of mystery amid the modern world's hustle and bustle. The third and largest basin, the Mobile Basin, drains more than 43,000 square miles of Tennessee, Mississippi, Georgia, and Alabama. And all of these waters flow through Alabama. It's no wonder that our first governor, William Wyatt Bibb, wanted to promote what many felt was the state's greatest natural asset. For the state seal, he chose to highlight the rivers. In some ways, this was simply an official recognition of what the earliest inhabitants of the area had known all along. Alabama is a water wonderland. The prehistoric peoples of this land built thriving communities of commerce and culture along the rivers. They plowed the waters in 40-foot long canoes, carrying goods in a complex system of trade that brought commerce from across the Appalachians, the Gulf Coast, Florida, and the upper Mississippi Valley. Later, for the Indians we know today, the Choctaw, Chickasaw, Cherokee, Creek, and Seminole. For these tribes too, the rivers provided natural infrastructure as well as political boundaries. When the Spanish set foot on the Gulf Coast in the 1500s, there were no detailed maps, no global positioning system. If they were to challenge the wilderness ahead, there was one key way in, the rivers. First of all, rivers are good transportation areas, not just because of the fact that you can float along the rivers, but also the rivers usually have uh, reasonably good flood plains that you can walk along. The, the Indians had used them for years, so basically the, the Europeans followed Indian trails, and the Indian trails were already well established, and they went along the rivers. From the earliest days of European settlement in Alabama, the pioneers followed the rivers. Here they found refreshing drinking water, plentiful game and fish, and rich alluvial soil suitable for agriculture. And while the rivers brought people together, they also provided natural boundaries that are still with us today. If you think of Alabama spatially, mobiles down here, the Tennessee Valley running basically east-west. Uh, that's the only east-west zone in Alabama because the Tennessee River comes in from Tennessee, runs across the northern part of the state. And oftentimes in Alabama history, that's called the Tennessee Group because most of those people came from Tennessee and they bring a sort of Jacksonian democratic ethos to Alabama. South of that zone, you've got rivers that are all running south, one of the most remarkable drainage systems in the United States. And that's basically a second major zone of settlement. Rivers continue to provide legal boundaries for many parts of Alabama counties here in the 21st century. And at three places, they separate us from neighboring states. There's the Chattahoochee marking our lower southeastern state line with Georgia. The Perdido separates us from Florida in the southwest. And many don't realize that the Tennessee River forms a brief border with Mississippi up in the northwestern corner of the state. Yes, we continue to use our rivers in much the same ways as our predecessors, for transportation. We still farm the fertile ground of the floodplains. We hunt and fish. We play. And most importantly, we renew ourselves daily with the living waters that flow from Alabama rivers.
We depend on our rivers, and in doing so, we change our rivers. The most visible examples of how we've changed our rivers are the dams. We dam the rivers for navigation, and we dam the rivers for electricity. Well, what this did was, first of all, it stopped the rivers, uh, the, it, and it changed the ecology. It's no longer a river ecology, it's a lake ecology. It's not a better or a worse ecology, it's just different. But it, it had a tremendous impact on certain species. The global epicenter of freshwater mollusk diversity is right here in the southeast. Tennessee River Basin has more species of mussels than any other basin in the world. The Mobile River Basin has more species of freshwater snails than any other river basin of its size in the world. So we have a diversity issue here that um, has global ramifications. In Alabama, we have the greatest diversity of fishes of any place in North America. And there's a number of uh, smaller fishes, some of the some of the darters and the smaller mad time catfishes that require, and some minnows that require uh, free flowing gravel bottom rivers for their existence. We don't have much of that left anymore. Here we see the Tallapoosa River from the Highway 280 bridge just below Alexander City. And here we see the Cahaba River at the Shelby County Road 59 bridge. What a difference a dam makes. The early dams were built before we really understood the long-term impact on a river ecosystem. And let's face it, even if we had understood, we probably would have still opted for the dams and the electricity. Dams may be the most visible influence on Alabama rivers in the 21st century, but they are hardly the only influence. Many aspects of agriculture, the pesticides and fertilizers we use, the animal waste that can accumulate, have often affected Alabama's water quality. Past timber practices have at times contributed to excessive sedimentation in Alabama streams, polluting runoff from coal mining, and chemicals from industrial waste have taken their toll. Since the passage of the Clean Water Act back in the 1970s, we've made great strides in correcting many of these more readily identifiable water quality problems. There is still much to be done. But we have made progress. Ironically though, many forms of progress now represent a growing threat to our freshwater resources. Rapid urbanization in many parts of Alabama and in neighboring states is distressing our rivers in new ways. Rainwaters, which once were filtered by the earth, now rush across construction sites, roadways, and parking lots, picking up oil and debris and clogging the streams with sediment. Many of the pollutants that contaminate our air also settle into our streams and affect water quality. And there are added dangers with uncontrolled growth. Expansion brings increased water consumption. Sprawling development and asphalt interfere with the recharge of groundwater. We've been faced with some drought situations and, uh, and, and increased withdrawal from our groundwater sources of water. Uh, we're seeing that recharge of those groundwater aquifers is not as good as it, as it should be, and we're seeing some, some, some dropping of our water levels uh, that uh, will sooner or later have impact on, on the availability of water. On many days you look out and the reservoirs are full, the streams are flowing full, there may even be puddles in your front yard, but a lot of entities and individuals in Alabama take their water from groundwater, water that you can't see. And so it's hard to understand and grasp the status of your groundwater resources. It could be that during a drought, your aquifer levels are decreasing greatly, and it takes them many years to respond to rainfall. As water supplies are stressed, we face another reality. Water quantity is often closely related to water quality. You're going to get to a situation with zero discharge. Is it uh, you will see wastewater plants pumping their water back to water treatment plants uh, because there is no available source of water. This is it. And I know everybody's going to go, ooh, but in life everybody needs to remember if somebody's downstream of you and, and they're drinking what you put out there. 
And so these are some cold, hard facts that people and politicians, you know, politicians plan for four years. That's their planning scenario. We in the water and wastewater industry have to plan for 50, 100 years out to see where we're going to be, what are we going to do, how are we going to provide this, where are our recharge zones, how do we protect those recharge zones. And these are issues we have not even began to touch yet. And I mean, these are going to be really sensitive issues. These are sensitive issues indeed. As competition increases for valuable clean water, many individuals and organizations across the state are beginning to take a stand, realizing that the time for action is now. It's been proven that it's critical for long-term restoration of a water body that the public be involved, that they understand the issues, and that they take those issues on and um, make a difference. And long-term, it's the people that live there uh, in that area, in that watershed, that are really going to make a difference in the water quality and make sure that the habitat is restored and the water quality continues. A lot of times groups will form over a particular crisis and when that crisis is over the groups will fall apart. We see it as our job to make sure that folks stay engaged, um, they continue to communicate with other folks in the watershed. That way watershed groups can avoid crises and avoid conflicts by being proactive as opposed to forming and responding to some crisis. What we try to do is involve citizens, uh, industries, uh, environmental groups, and government elected officials. Uh, and the stakeholder process. And as you can imagine, that's a pretty hard thing to do because uh, those entities have never played together before. Along with citizen groups, government agencies are taking an increasingly hard look at water resources. We've been able to work with a wide array of, of groups and bring people together that were historically on the opposite sides of issues. But the only way that we're going to move forward as a state is to sit in a room, understand each other's concerns and needs, and work together to develop the plans and uh, management programs. We uh, work with the uh, Alabama Department of Environmental Management and the Environmental Protection Agency when they consider development proposals and discharge permits for introduction of waste to Alabama rivers. The Geological Survey has a long history of, of cooperation with other agencies in the state and federal agencies such as the United States Geological Survey, the Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, in the state of Alabama we work very close, closely with the Alabama Department of Environmental Management, uh, the Alabama Department of Conservation of Natural Resources, the Alabama Department of Economic and Community Affairs Office of Water Resources. We try to work with all of these people so that we're all uh, working together cooperatively to try to do what's best for the state in terms of understanding and managing our water resources. As concern grows for freshwater supplies, so does the understanding that we need to look at the big picture, the very big picture. One of the great areas of progress, I think, in, in our water quality approaches in the last few years is to consider the watershed approach and to approach it from that perspective. Um, the watershed does not respect political boundaries, and so if you want to conduct um, activities that are going to affect the water quality of that watershed, you have to look at everything that's going on within that watershed and everything that's coming into that watershed regardless of the political boundary. We all need to recognize that uh, the ecosystem that we all live in is influenced by the water quantity, the water quality, and the watershed. Uh, until we look at it from that perspective, uh, we're not going to have a really good understanding on what it takes to put that together. Uh, so we need to think about it from the ecosystem perspective and do what we can do uh, collectively to make that happen. Ultimately, we're all going to have to make some very difficult choices. Already, our neighbor Atlanta, Georgia, has exceeded water use they had predicted for the year 2030. Meanwhile, the Atlanta population continues to expand. The sprawl around Atlanta has basically gobbled up a lot of the nice stream areas that, that existed in that region. From there, the downstream reaches of those streams have also been impacted by the growth. So it's not just um, the immediate area that's affected, it's, it's a regional effect. I think people, politicians, and everybody else have to make a decision is how much do we want to grow, how fast do we want to grow, and then understand what the side effects are going to be down the road. I think we need to take a strong look at where we are 
and determine how many people that we want can and can sustain in this country. And I think it's going to boil back down to each county and each town and each district deciding how they want their city to look, how they want their countryside to look. My personal opinion is I think that we can sustain growth uh, for the immediate future. But we've got to do things a lot different, differently than we have in the past. Uh, we can't continue to develop like we have over the last 100 years. We can't do it and sustain the natural systems that are in this state. And if people want to continue down that road, they're making the choice for having an Alabama that is entirely different than the Alabama that we know today and we have known in the past. That's a terrible trade-off in my mind. It's a terrible loss for this state. It's a terrible loss for the heritage of the children who will be our successors on this planet. It won't be easy planning for the future, but the stakes are worth every effort because clean, fresh water is an issue in which every Alabamian has a stake. So much of our prosperity depends upon how well we care for the natural environment around us. The term that's used is ecosystem services. Uh, most people are in, uh, innately aware of what we mean by that in terms of, of uh, the, where our water comes from, you know, how much is left in the ground, the, purity of our streams uh, and uh, the productivity of our soil and there's so much more that we're waking up to and that is a sense of pride uh, and a sense of place. As we debate how we will protect this precious resource in coming years, there will be no lack of opinions as to how we should proceed. Among the opinions, I hope, we will continue to hear the voices of those Alabamians who simply love the rivers. I think the rivers in, in Alabama are the remnants of the real wildness that exists from this state. This is the true character of what Alabama is. Broad the stream whose name thou bearest, grand thy Bigby rolls along. Fair thy Kusa, Tallapoosa, bold thy warrior, dark and strong. To thy northern vale where floweth, deep and blue thy Tennessee. Alabama, Alabama, we will I be true to thee. So read the words of our state song. It's kind of difficult to write a song about Alabama without mentioning the rivers. A pleasant ride up and down the river. A blessing we can enjoy no matter where we are in this wonderful aquatic state. And a blessing we take for granted. Let's hope we can always take it for granted because in a world thirsting for a drop of fresh water to renew the flesh, we in Alabama have the luxury of enjoying our waters for renewing the spirit. It not only supports us, as it has supported countless generations of human beings before and continues now to support us, but also it's part of our history, it's part of our heritage. And that's why people love nature. When they get a chance to enjoy it, it's just a nature walk, you know, a trip up a river. They go through a, a sense of, of transformation, of peace.
This program is supported by grants from the Solon and Martha Dixon Foundation, the Alabama Wildlife Federation, working for wildlife since 1935, Legacy, Partners in Environmental Education, and the Alabama Department of Conservation and Natural Resources.